going to happen now is just very briefly, um, I will just take you through a few slides where I have tried to put together after basically reading three uh, major papers um, around health systems and <coughs> ethnographies of health systems just to take you through some classical ethnographies and examples and so on. After that, you have homework. So, each crew will can choose their one of the six problems, the HPSR problems. We are not forcing it on you, it is up to you what you want to choose. Um, but the idea is that you people go back or you sit together and talk in groups and sort of start trying to see what in with if that is a problem, what are the types of questions that you could ask which may be answered through this ethnographic approach. Okay, so what did everyone think of this? As you can see, I mean he just says they are tweeting, so it is all virtual and people are saying yes and no. So, that is that's the reality that still is there today. Um, so, one bright light was these eight papers which were curated by Arima and uh, Katrina and it came out last year. So, I think we all agree to a large extent after all through the days <coughs> readings and exercises and after what Nakiran spoke to you that the ethnographic approach is well suited to bring into the open a social and political perspective to the study of politics and practices of diverse health systems. As you saw in all your papers, they were quite diverse. But as you know, as that picture said, it has largely stayed off the radar of public health research community. And to some extent, it is because it is not, I mean, people say that it is not rigorous enough to inform public policy and practice. That is one of the reasons. But the other reason is also because a lot of the ethnographic work <coughs> gets published in really very specialist sort of disciplinary journals. You know, it is very rare that you come across if you go to even social science and medicine or HPP or BMJ or Lancet and it is very rare to find and we probably will never get accepted also in some of these journals. So, that is a reality. So, what I am going to do is that maybe take you to through some of the uh, classical ethnographies and what have they done you know for health systems, you know what is it about health systems that they have looked at. So, one of the things is to remember is that the classical ethnography is actually quite rare in applied health research and that is because of constraints on time and practical feasibility. The other issues is that funding or money that we get for research work tends to be for way short spans, it is never really sort of you know a long kind of thing that is one. But also maybe uh, the uh, it is rare because the ethnographic approach actually does not resonate with most health related study designs. But I think what we need to take away from today's well basically conversations that we have had is that, that actually medical anthropologists and sociologists who use this method do offer important insights in terms of understanding HPS health policy systems. So, what have these classical ethnographies done? So, those there are some that have followed either a life or lives of individuals and groups affected by a particular health condition. They have developed an understanding of how and why people are enabled or hindered in their efforts to make use of services and manage their conditions. And here I put in bracket especially in sorry that is a typo in chronic health illness. So, actually and I think Matthew would agree that in the 90s there was a flurry of publications around chronic illness, what it meant to be chronically ill, how do you <coughs> negotiate within the system. So, and there were people like Bury and there is a whole range of people who came up out of which actually grew some of the methods, uh, some of the things around autoethnographies and so on. So, but what they did was that they basically showed that because of that particular condition, how are they seen within the system? How do they navigate the system? 
Is the system prepared to deal with them? Are policies in place to deal with them? So these are the kinds of things that you know they uh, brought about. Now, so a good example is that it has examined how people living with a condition draw on a collective biosocial identity to formulate claims to treatment, compensation, and other social resources. So in relation to HIV, HIV is a good example. Some have argued that this form of therapeutic citizenship has directly affected policies around access to treatment and delivery of care. So what, have they, what is it that brought them together? It wasn't caste, it wasn't class, it wasn't anything. It was their illness, it was a condition that brought them together. So some of the class, classical ethnographies actually show that there is another way people can organize. So now you have the disability, you have breast cancer groups, you have the, you know, there are many of these things that you can see across venue. So I think the, uh, that has been the value of that work, that how people maybe come together because of their illness and then negotiate and demand from uh, systems. Then there are ethnographies that have explicitly focused on practitioners, the professional socialization within health systems. So what did these do? They provide an insight into the feasibility of health system interventions that assume or introduce shifts in professional hierarchies or working arrangements. Now, so what what do these ethnographies do? They basically examine how working environments and dynamics shape identities, professional identities, and interprofessional collaboration. And then a much earlier paper by Justice where what Justice did was that basically he looked, at that time they were called peons, we don't call them peons anymore, we have other names for them. But basically, he brought to light working cultures of the less visible. So even for us, through the day we've been talking about medical professionals, community health professionals, we haven't actually talked about a lot of the other people in the system who make it. The sweepers, the cleaners who keep the places clean. So what do you think would happen in hospitals if the jamadars go on strike? Why is there such an outcry if they go on strike? because it affects the functioning. So in some ways, so this is, these are just sort of uh, to give you examples and take you through some things. So that is one. Then there are ethnographies that have focused on organizations as well. So what do they aim to do? They aim to examine how work activities shape and maintain the institution, analysis of ideological procedures that make these processes accountable, they also explore how these work practices that exist within the system are intricately connected to other social processes. So what does, what do organizational, classic organizational eth ethnographies do? They actually allow for a nuanced analysis of organizational culture and dynamics. So it's a means of identifying, for example, how the organization's formal structures, which are rules and decision-making hierarchies, are influenced by an informal system created by individuals or group within that organization as well. So these are like some are hospital ethnographies, project ethnographies. So they are at the national level, international level, you know, local institutional codes of practice and so on. So these are uh, some of the things. But what ethnographies have done also is that they focused on controversies and debates. So, and what is the purpose? It is because they want to bring to light the tensions that exist between rhetoric and actual practice in health system relationships. You see, so, so the Gavi uh, thing is also around the controversy associated with Gavi. You know, what is Gavi? Why? What is this? You know, what role does it have? You know, this Taylor actually, it's believed, I'm not so sure it's true, but a lot of, pe I've seen that a lot of people do say that he took an ethnography of a health system where he used a local controversy over resource allocation in a small sort of Scottish archipelago. 
But what he did was through the ethnography, he actually showed how different groups within that system formulate and pursue the interests both within and outside of the formal structure of the local. So the doctors who were part, for example, they were part of the local health system, how they leveraged their position within the health system then to intervene in the outside uh, social system. And then there were people on the outside, you know, retired <coughs> bureaucrats and people who became members of, you know, some of the committees and they leveraged that position they had on the outside to influence policies. So they were not necessarily people who worked in the health system too. So there you can see, and it's a very nice, simple sort of paper that um, I put up. I think it, it's worth reading even just like that. To, uh. But the truth is that actually extensive ethnographies of biomedical practice and health systems in LMIC settings, we don't have a lot. Um, so th these are just a few that I have put up there. So Kare basically, um, he talked these things around traditional healing as opposed to every day of uh, practicing practiced medicine, how it's practiced in the Indian health system. And then there was Alan's work and then there's Justice's work in Nepal on international health uh, bureaucracy. I think again this for to a great extent it reflects power equations between knowledge brokers in health systems as well. So like you said, you know, it seems it's very difficult actually, but we also don't have enough, um, how do you say, enough social capital in our own countries, in our own settings as ethnographers, as anthropologists, as sociologists to get to that mass where you make that difference and then push to say. They may be lone people, so we have someone like Veena Das who no longer lives in India, we have someone like Akhil Gupta who has never lived in India. So they may have Indian names, but I don't know how Indian, you know, whether there is something called Indian too, that is also a question. So what I am trying to say is that that, that, is the, that is your material reality in which you do ethnographic work in LMIC. Uh, but I am going to focus on this thing about global health because the policies and practices of global health has gained, there has been quite, you know, intense debate. Um, it is it's also a lot of quite some publications around this area and some really sort of you know revered big names like Kleinman, Veena Das, Mark Nichter, Paul Farmer among others, there are many others as well but these are like the main people who have worked in terms of ethnographies of uh, global health. So but what have they done? I think by in a in almost like a zealous fashion, you know, they, there was this push that they had to bring this. At least they have set the agenda for a debate. So that much they have been sort of able to do with their work. So what are the areas that they have looked at? So essentially they have looked at interaction and effects of global health policies and programs. What happens when these programs interact with weak health systems? of fragmented health systems or so on. And how does that, that meeting or that interaction, whatever is that meeting, how does it shape access for people and how does it shape ill health experiences? So there is a lot of writing around this that you can um, look about. And one of the uh, other areas where they have written is around what happened, what were the local consequences of all the fiscal adjustment programs that happened across parts of the globe starting from Latin America onwards. So there is a lot of very rich writing arguments, positions around this issue. And what happened when this push came for privatization and of care and its um, consequences? Then uh, Paul Farmer specifically uh, in some ways has talked about also that health systems should reflect about their role 
in reproducing what he calls structural violence. And structural violence means how social arrangements put people and populations in harm's way. There's a whole sort of reading you want. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit around this. I think till now we've been saying, oh, we want to go and study what's happening in the health systems and so on. But like we said, I think in the last, all these days, we all have somewhere agreed that these it is a, whether it's a social institution, it's a social system, that much we agree. I think where we have not really looked at is that how do health systems intervene outside their space, in the outside social life and what kind of effects can this have. There is not a lot of work but there is some work in the US where ethnographers have actually, um, they have written about how the <coughs> local health systems and how they perceive migrant workers, how they differentiate migrants from Cuba vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, vis-a-vis -vis Costa Rica, how those perceptions of those systems and policies that are in place actually harm. So while you may say that we have a universal health care or health for all thing, but in practice, health systems also can have very negative consequences to well-being of people, groups of people. Um, there is not a lot of writing around this, but I think now it is slowly sort of beginning to emerge in terms of how people are um, writing about it. Why I think, why ethnographies of HPS, I mean just to sort of pull the whole day's thing together is, it actually offers a unique research space to better understand context which all those elements of policies and policy formulation and how these are translated and come alive in health systems. It also lends itself well to a nuanced analysis of the relationships between power, knowledge and practice as we saw in some of the papers that we uh, talked about, especially the abortion paper. But also I, I feel that there are, there are different, so we actually didn't go into a lot of types of ethnographies and things like that today because we thought it would be too much. But there are different types of it, characteristics of ethnographies. And they can be total, single sided, multiple sided, institutional, classical, like you know, like I showed the, the chimpanzee sitting like looking very confused. But the confusion is rich and confusion is necessary for disciplines to grow. So these actually can be used towards understanding of health systems. So I think broadly um, through the day somehow, somewhere that's what we've been trying to communicate to you, that this is an approach which has its own moorings, principles, ethics, rigor, etc. But it's also a very exciting space where you can do some really interesting work if you want to. So I just want to acknowledge that all of this is not mine. This presentation basically comes from these three <coughs> readings. So if you want to know more, I think it would be great if you can go back to these papers and read if you want to know more about ethnographies and health systems. And I'm going to end with this.